Welcome to this presentation of Introduction to Java Server Pages. My name is Kevin Flanagan, and I'll be your instructor. The unauthorized reproduction or distribution of this copyrighted work is illegal. Criminal copyright infringement, including infringement without monetary gain, is investigated by the FBI and is punishable by up to five years in federal prison and a fine of $250,000. If you have any questions about any of the information covered in this presentation, pre please use the question and comment box at any time. In this module, we'll cover the issues of what are JSPs? Where did they come from? Why do they exist? Um, what do they do for us? What issues they were meant to address? We'll also take a look at what are the benefits of using JSPs. And we're going to see that the main reason for using JSPs is to try to simplify what we had to do to create response objects in a servlet environment, especially formatted into HTML. To a large degree, this is an attempt to simplify or alleviate the problem of writing an excessive number of system.out.println statements. We also want to look at how JSPs compare to other technologies, uh, such as Active Server Pages, ASP from uh, Microsoft, uh, and in our case, whether it's ASP or ASP.NET, it's still the same types of issues that need to be addressed. Uh, we also want to see how JSPs compare to, directly to servlets. Um, I think in this case that when we compare them directly to serv servlets, the benefits of JSPs are much more obvious. We want to take a look at what is the structure of a JSP. Well, the first thing we can say about what a structure of a JSP is, it's basically an HTML file. Most everything is HTML, but there's going to be pieces of Java code embedded in it. It's going to be the server's responsibility, in our case Tomcat, which is really the, uh, just a name for a type of servlet container. What does Tomcat need to do to that JSP file to make a running servlet out of it? And that's the issue of how a server in, servlet interprets a JSP. It's basically going to fall into two categories. The first time is, or the first category is when the initial encounter of the JSP file uh, occurs. Uh, somebody will type in a JSP file, and what's going to happen is that the server says, oh, I haven't seen this before. So what it will do is generate servlet source from the JSP file. Once the source is generated, then it will have to compile the actual servlet, the dot class file from that source. And then once that's done successfully, then it executes that source. Subsequent invocations, we'll see, basically check the timestamp on the .jsp file and on the .class file, and then determines what it needs to do based on which one is more current. We'll also take a look at the evolution of JSPs in terms of the standards, basically starting around 99 with version 1.0, then we'll take a quick look at version uh, 2.0 and then into version 2.1. Uh, and what types of things were included in each one of the new standard releases? How do JSPs simplify environmental considerations? And we'll look at a couple of areas, specifically things like uh, class path that we had to be concerned about, if certainly in the Java environment, and with things like servlets. Do we have to place things in particular directory structures? Are packages an issue? Is that something we needed to worry about? So there's quite a few things that have been immensely simplified by utilizing JSPs versus regular Java code. And then lastly, we'll look at what the different components of JSP are, and we'll take a look at a JSP sample. And when we're done with that, what we're going to do is a live demo of a sample so we can see the pieces when they're in movement rather than just seeing them statically. Uh, sometimes it's a little easier to see things when they're executed. Uh, now keep keeping in mind that when we do the example, we have not had the opportunity yet to look at the syntax for the different pieces of HTML and Java. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a look at the HTML and see the sequence of what happens. We also want to look at JSP components and an example of JSPs. Uh, what we'll do in this module at the end is we'll do a live demo, because sometimes talking about how all the, what all the pieces are is not quite the same as seeing how they all interact. Uh, 
So we will do a live demo. In the next module, we'll, deal, we'll get into more details about what internally goes into a JSP. But on our first pass, we just want to see something about the behavior. OK, so first, what are JSPs? Well, they're a server-side technology, which means for us, from the Java perspective, they are part of Java EE. Basically, a JSP is going to be translated into a servlet. We don't have to write all the code, but that's really what happens. Now, when we talk about simplifying the creation of HTTP servlets, let's just quickly review the idea of servlets uh, to start with. Okay. Servlets run in a servlet container. Okay. Our, our servlet container of choice for this course is Tomcat. Okay. But a servlet also must implement the servlet interface, either directly or indirectly. So if we start out with the idea of servlet being an interface and we implement it, we know from regular Java programming that means that now we're responsible for overriding all the methods whether or not we intend to use them at all. So our first attempt at servlets, we probably went out and said, well, is there a class that already implements the servlet interface? And we found something called the generic servlet class. The generic servlet class is exactly what its name implies. It is a generic servlet that is not optimized for any particular transport protocol. Okay. So knowing that, we can say, well, we can use the generic servlet, but at the same time, we know that most often the protocol of choice is going to be HTTP. So it would be nice if we could start with a servlet that's optimized for HTTP. And lo and behold, if we go out and look at the documentation in the Java doc, what we'll find is that there's something called HTTP servlet, which extends the generic servlet and is optimized for HTTP. And lastly, what servlets will do for us is allow a separation of the request and response processing. And in purest form, we can think, again, using our analogy to servlets themselves, of the request and response objects. Really what we're trying to do is that we'll find that servlets really are best suited for request and delegation. They're not suited for heavy lifting. They're not meant to do things, for example, that a, uh, a session bean can do in EJB. Also, when we use the response, sometimes writing the response with a lot of system.out.println statements could be very laborious and time consuming. So if we can split that off and have that generated for us automatically, that's a big help for us in terms of developing a JSP and in turn the servlet that will be generated from the JSP. And so here's another way of looking at it. When we take a look at what's the benefit or benefits of using JSPs, first of all, most of the page is written in HTML. The key term there is most of the page. It doesn't say all of it. So what we have to remember is that while most of the page is written in HTML, there are going to be other lines of code in there that represent actual Java invocations. So we are going to have these snippets of Java code intermingled with our HTML. And as just mentioned, the main reason for doing that is to try to eliminate all these excessive println statements when we're trying to produce the response coming back from the processing. The servlet code, the piece, basically the piece that's not HTML, is going to be represented by special tags within the page itself. Okay. So those, those two pieces, the leftmost, the idea of most of it being HTML, and the rightmost, where we talk about the servlet code, those two pieces together will actually be used by the servlet container, its JSP engine, to generate our servlet for us. And that's what we mean the entire page gets translated into a servlet. Okay? But it's really written more as text. It's really not written the way we've traditionally approached programming, where we say we're writing a piece of code. It is a little bit more freeform because it does look like HTML, but all of a sudden in the middle of a piece of HTML, we'll see something, see something that looks like Java code. OK, now how does JSP compare to other technologies? Okay. The first one we'll look at is, is ASP. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking traditional ASP or ASP.NET. This is the idea of an active server page in the Windows environment. Okay. And the way JSPs compare to that is that JSPs are not, first and foremost, limited just to the Windows platform. They can run virtually on any platform that has Java. The 
flavors of Unix, uh, ZOS on the IBM mainframe, uh, Linux, just about any OS at all will allow us to run uh, JSPs. Basically, anything that can run Java can run a JSP provided we have the appropriate serv servlet container. Okay. Now, if we compare these directly to servlets themselves, okay, how do J JSPs compare to servlets? Okay, in this regard, first thing is that since we're using primarily HTML as the body of the, the file that we're writing, it's mostly HTML, we can use any standard HTML editing tool. In our case, we're going to be using the editors that are available within Eclipse, but we could be using any, any uh, of readily available tool. Also, as mentioned earlier, servlets are really good at handling requests and delegating. That would be the second piece that I would put in there. Servlets are good at handling requests and delegating. Okay. What we're talking about is the response object. So JSPs are better at presenting the response because what they try to do is alleviate the overhead for us of having to write all those system.out.println statements. When we look at JSP structure, first thing we want to say is JSP, it is an HTML file. That's a, that's a pretty emphatic statement. Okay? We're, we're not confusing it with anything else. It is really an HTML file. It's an HTML file, though, that has not, the extension of .jsp, not .htm or HTML. It has the extension of JSP. That's one of the ways the servlet container recognizes them. The client will invoke the URL of the JSP file. When we, and we'll see when we do the live demo, and we'll see actually an example, uh, what looks like a browser. We've invoked the URL in the browser, and certain things happen on the server side. So our next question is to say, what exactly happens on the server side? How does it interpret a JSP? Again, the server for us is Tomcat. Okay. The first thing, on initial invocation, the very first time that we invoke that URL for the JSPs, uh, the JSP, a couple of things have to happen for us to make it work. First, the server creates the servlet source from the JSP. Now, it n says servlet source, and that's exactly what gets generated. It's the actual servlet. We didn't write it. We wrote the, we wrote the JSP file, which we already saw as HTML, but the source gets generated by the JSP engine within Tomcat in our case. Okay. Once that servlet source is generated, the next thing that has to be done is to compile the source into a running servlet. Okay, so obviously we're going to assume that all compilation errors have been taken care of. We don't have any kind of information within the HTML file, i.e. .jsp file, that will cause the compiler any problems. And lastly, what the server will do is execute the compiled servlet. Okay. Once the servlet's been compiled from the generated source, it's set to go. At that point, it's really no different from a servlet that we wrote from scratch. It'll do the same, can do anything that we could have done by writing it ourselves. Now, that's on the initial invocation. What happens on all subsequent invocations? First thing that happens is that the server will compare the timestamp of the .jsp file and the generated servlet class. In other words, what came out of the compile. Okay. So one is going to be newer than the other. Okay. If it's the .jsp file that's newer, i.e. more current, the servlet class gets regenerated. And what that means is that the source gets regenerated, the source is compiled, and then it's executed. It's everything that we just did on the previous slide. If the servlet timestamp is more current, basically it says, I don't need to recompile or regenerate. I don't need to regenerate the source code. I don't need to recompile it. All I have to do is execute the available servlet class that's already been generated. Okay, in terms of evolution, okay, first and foremost, JSP has a very specific specification, okay, or very definite specification. And they've gone through several layers. The first, 1999, introduced version 1.0. 1, 1 for our purposes, basically 1.0 laid down the rules for what constitutes a JSP and what kind of things a JSP engine in a servlet container would have to do to generate a servlet out of 
our .jsp file. 2003 version 2.0 came along. Version 2.0 introduced the idea of the expression language, okay, which was an alternate way of specifying Java code within our JSP file. 2006 introduced version 2.1. And the, one of the main things that came out of version 2.1 and what was going on at the time was this is the beginning of really, this is really when Java EE5 was being rolled out. Okay, Java EE5 had quite a few things going on with it. Not necessarily everything related to JSPs. In other words, there was a new spec, there was an EJB30 spec that came out affecting how the structure of enterprise Java beans were supposed to be done. But in version 2.1, the main thing that we're, we would be looking at was the addition of what we would call the unified expression language, which was an attempt to try to unify the expression language being used in Java server faces JSF as well as JSTL, the Java uh, standard tag libraries. Okay, those two languages were similar, but they weren't unified, and this was an attempt to make sure that they look the same in all environments. Okay. Now, in what ways does a JSP simplify our environmental considerations? Well, first, class path issues really are not as demanding as they were when we wrote servlets. Servlets usually lived in a package, which meant that we had to point things all over the place if we, if we had different packages involved. Uh, we'll see that this goes directly to the idea of how much information we have to supply regarding directories. Okay. Compilation. Well, when we wrote servlets, we had to compile them. Okay. That may not sound like much, but the point is we wrote the source. Once we wrote the source, then we had to do the compile, make sure that everything passed through the compiler. Compilation now is done by the JSP engine. Java packages, as I mentioned, this is really related in many ways to the idea of class path. Because the Java packages were places where we would put the servlet classes. And there was no requirement, certainly, and maybe not even a desirability of putting them all in the same package. They might be in multiple different packages. So we had to be cognizant of what packages were available. Uh, were they in the class path? Did we put the right things in the right packages? And the last, the last thing we needed to worry about is that related to that, we had to be concerned about specific directory structures, which is really what packages do relate to. That's not going to be an issue for us with JSPs. As we'll see, basically we can put them just about any place where the system is able to find them within the tool. Okay, now in terms of what kind of things make up JSP, okay, things we're going to look at first are things like expressions. Okay, maybe something that evaluates to a particular value. Maybe I want to go out and get a request parameter called name. I want to find out what somebody put in as their name on an HTML file. And in the JSP, I'm going to have ways of retrieving something like that. Okay. Java scriptlets. Okay. These, are, these are snippets of Java code itself that can be placed in our code. Okay. Again, what we're trying to do is get to the point of not having to write the entire servlet from scratch. We want to take an advantage, advantage of the idea of simplifying what we need to do. However, we may have special needs that require that we put this information within our .jsp file. Okay. We also have things called declarations. When we start looking at declarations, we might see that there are, for example, certain types of things that we want to do to in, for inheritance or maybe for importing. So there's things that we can declare that might influence the compiler's behavior when it's invoked by the JSP engine. So our JSP components, we're going to look at things like directives. Okay. What action needs to be taken? Okay. And the expression language itself. The expression language we're not going to be looking at in this particular module. We are going to be looking at it in a later module. Okay. And now what we have is a JSP example. Now the first thing we could take a look at that I'm highlighting, if we look at the line, we are pleased to have you as a customer. That looks like straightforward HTML. The second line I highlighted, here's the information you entered. That is regular HTML. And then we see a couple of lines underneath it. Oop, not there. Back up here. 
we see what looks like regular HTML in these three lines together. And then underneath it, we have TD, which is an HTML line. But we'll notice that underneath that, we have something a little bit different. We have a less than sign, followed by a percent sign, followed by an equal sign. And then we see something that says request.getParameter, and then in parens, username. Well, if we've written servlets, this looks a little bit familiar. The idea of getting a parameter, so it says, well, I have some type of a parameter called username. I want to get its value. Okay. So we get its value from where? From the request object. In the next module, we'll look at the actual syntax required. Remember that what we're doing here is really more of a test drive than anything else. And if we go down a little bit further, we notice that we see request parameter down in here, request get parameter street. We have request get parameter city, request get parameter state. So obviously, we're trying to obtain from our request object different values that have apparently been put on some type of input screen. OK, now that's the end of our presentation for introduction to Java server pages. Okay. If you have any questions or comments about the information covered in this presentation, please use the question and comment box. And I'll try to get back to you as quickly as possible. And thank you for joining me for this module.